I've spent years. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I got the opportunity to start hanging out with the cool kids, so I took advantage of that and uh, I've been working a little bit in the uh, middle end stuff. So, why in the world would somebody want to give a talk about strength production? What a whole core of optimization is strength production. It's been out there forever, right? So, why do we need it here? Um, well, the fact is, GCC is missing a lot of strength production. And uh, it was sort of surprising to me. Um, some of the old web reports that are sitting out there about strength reduction and some of the uh, uh, kind of embarrassing code that we generate as a result. Um, we do a very good job in GCC of strength reducing reduction variables. Reduction variables by the very nature are very nice and regular, and they're loose, and uh, they're relatively easy once you analyze them to do strength reduction. Um, as I was working on trying to clean up some of these bug reports and, and take all of these things into one generalized framework, it turned out to be a more interesting topic than I originally thought it would be. So, uh, this is an ongoing project. Uh, we got just the first bits of it uh, in the trunk a couple of weeks ago. We got one other small piece that's been submitted, and so far we've just uh, in like the very simple forms. Um, but the rest of it's out there, it's been prototyped. Um, just uh, needs a little bit of extra work. I'm very interested in the input that uh, people have, and it should be very interactive if you uh, want to talk to and want to shout out. I might like to miss for these kind of cues, and this is sort of lines. And, uh, anyway, to, to motivate this stuff, let's talk a little bit about some of the embarrassing examples that, that I was looking at. And the next three slides are examples that come out of the Bugzilla database. And as you'll see over here on the left, we've got something where we're just doing some array, keep referencing, um, and we keep, you know, we assign, we add two to a number in the media array, and put it in the data array, corresponding thing. Keep adding one, do it again. And look at this horrible piece of code that we generated over here on the side. For every single one of those things, let's just look at the stuff in red, that's the stuff that's, that's uh, involved in the A's. Um, and there's also a, a line right above. Um, there is a line up there too that's also part of it. So there's, there's a, I want you to remember this cast that's stuck in the middle of this because that, that becomes, that's a really irritating issue. But, uh, so, so we have this thing where we take i, we cast it to this long unsigned thing, we multiply it by four, and then we add it to this base uh, atoms. Now, we add one to i, and we go through that whole process again, which is a waste of time because we could just add four to the thing that we just calculated. So uh, we have a tremendous amount of extra code here to do something that's extremely simple. Here's another embarrassing thing. Um, the, in the example on the left, you'll see that we are calculating the value 2a plus 4 twice. Um, and GCC is unable to recognize that fact. But we already know what 2a plus 4 is. So the first instruction, two instructions do it by adding a plus 2 and then multiplying by 2 next to multiply a by 2 and add 4. Um, the code that we generate on the right is an exact copy of the code that's on the left. The stuff that's on the right is the gimbal at the end of the middle, uh, middle of the optimization basis. So we do absolutely no optimization at all on this one. We should just get rid of the entire function return true. Um, and this is the example that got me started on looking at these things in the first place. Here we have a structure that's got three arrays in it, and we're going to um, access the same index of those three arrays. And so what you want to do is just calculate the address based on the base of the array and the index once. And then you should be able to find a constant difference between that address and the next addresses. But we don't do that. We go ahead and calculate each of these addresses individually by doing multiplies, which are on the right, we have PowerPC code here. So if you don't speak PowerPC, I'm sorry about that. That's what I know. Um, these are shifts, uh, shift left doubles, which correspond to multiplying by four. So we multiply these, these, these values by four three times and then do these three, three adds in this index load form down here. Again, quite wasteful, quite surprising. Um, just, you know, my, my opinion of TCC used to be really high. <laughs> So, okay, so why should we develop a separate pass to do this work for strength reduction? And this cartoon is a representative of some of the reaction that, that I got uh, from certain people when I, when I said, oh, I'd like to, to put this in as a separate pass. Um, certain people were very supportive of this, but others, you know, 
I think I got a note with the like, microseconds of posting the patch saying, I don't think there should be a separate patch. So I like, okay. But, but I do have reasons for it. I wasn't just doing it because I wanted to, to have the glory of having a separate pass in uh, GCC. <laughs> um, the, the common practice in a lot of compilers is to do strength reduction as part of partial redundancy implementation. And especially if you're doing the, uh, the uh, loop based strength reduction for reduction variables, that, that's a sensible place to do it as long as you're doing the reduction variable analysis. But really, there are some disadvantages. And one is uh, something else it's called lookup problem for now. I'll talk more about that on the next slide. Um, another point is that for figuring out what the best candidates to replace are, you really want to view a bunch of different candidates at the same time, uh, which is harder to do with just basic value numbering. Um, uh, with, with partial reduction, reduction elimination, which is based on looking at a single thing at a time. Um, Strength reduction is a special handling for those stupid tasks like we saw on that previous slide because you're, you're changing the type halfway through the calculation of what you're looking at. That's, that's a little bit of a mess. And we also need to insert some instructions for strength on strength reduction. But the insertion is very easy, whereas doing insertion in partial redundancy elimination in GCC is a bit complicated. Doing a bunch of uh, something called fee translation in order to work your way back through, which is it's just more work than is necessary. So when we talk about this value number and lookup problem really quickly, um, on this, uh, at the top there, this statement mark S1 is uh, one form of a strength reduction can. I'll talk about some other forms uh, in a coming slide. But the, the, the common thing here is that we have a base value B, which is, can be an address or can just be a scalar value. We have an index I, and we have a scribe S, we use for multiplying <coughs> times the base plus the index. If we want to reduce that expression, we want to find something that looks pretty similar to it that's available to us earlier in the program. So what I've got marked here as S0 is um, one that looks like this. It has the exact same base B, the exact same stride S, but it's got a different constant index, which I've marked as I prime. Okay. If we have this, then the way that we'll do the strength reduction is to re replace the statement S1 with the statement S1 prime, where it'll be um, based on the previous S0. So we say x is going to be equal to y plus c, so we're adding 4 in some of these examples I've been looking at, for example, where c is this i minus i prime multiplied by the strike. And that's just a matter of, of doing the algebra there. You can see that that works out. So we've gotten rid of a multiply and replaced it uh, with uh, replacing the add and multiply with a single i. The problem with looking up what we need in partial redundancy elimination is the fact that I prime is completely arbitrary. We can use any value of I prime for this. So we look, we need to find something that's got one of a really large number of possible values, and you can't just go looking them all up. Um, in practice, a common case that you'll see and that we had on the first slide was that you just look up I minus one and hope that's the one that you care about. But um, you know, that, that often is a good thing, but it gives you pretty good results. Okay, so there are various kinds of strength reduction opportunities that, are, um, that we were looking at on those earlier slides. Um, in, in some of the opportunities, the multiplies are explicitly called out on the table. So you can see, you know, you just got x times y, and that's what you're trying to get rid of. Um, a subclass of that is when you have the stride being a constant, a known constant or the stride is an unknown constant value. It still uh, stays the same in all these different can candidates, but you don't know what it is. Okay, so different uh, approaches need to be used for those two cases. Then we have cases where the multiplies are hidden inside address and expressions, and that's like the structure that has the multiple arrays inside of it. That will look like just a, uh, um, a component reference to us, and we have to tease out what's going on inside of it. Finally, there's a variant on both forms of those explicit multiplies where uh, the increment isn't uh, guaranteed to occur. You might have had some sort of uh, conditional control flow processing where you incremented along some paths but not along others. So we want to still be able to strength reduce things that happen below those kinds of paths. So an example of that is here at the bottom. Uh, I can barely see it. You probably can't see it at all. But, um, <coughs> 
it, you have a condition there that's just uh, three dots. We're going to increment i along that path, not along the other possible path to this uh, a sub i down below. So um, we want to be able to replace this multiply of i times g uh, with an n for, from the other i times g, if possible. But because we have this condition we in the way, that's going to mess us up. So the goals of this work um, were to come together with a single framework that's going to ha handle all these kinds of cases. Uh, so it needs to be flexible. We need to have recognize what the common features of are all these, of all these different kinds of things. And we'll abstract those into a uh, basic uh, data structure, which is the Canada table. Uh, very important that we improve things and not make them worse. So I didn't want to get in the way of the existing strength reduction or the reduction curve. So as a result, this is uh, scheduled in the past manager following um, all of the loop optimizations. For efficiency, we want to do this in a single forward pass over the vehicle. We don't want to do any kind of uh, extreme analysis. And we want to use a cost model to make it profitable. So we want to reflect the capabilities of the target machine and make sure that we're making replacements that really are good replacements. <laughs> Finally, for efficacy purposes, we want to uh, uh, process as many candidates as we possibly can. To do that, we're going to look not just in a single basic block for these opportunities, but we're going to look across the program through what through, through, we dominated paths. <laughs> Most of you aren't sure know what dominance are, but for those who don't, we'll have a brief discussion later. And as part of that, we want to make sure that when we replace something with an ad, that if that produces more opportunities for strength reduction, we'll continue to cash those. So, this is a room full of compiler people, so I will just point out that I have a few things about compilers here on this slide. And you all know pretty much what a basic block is. It's a maximum time to parameter your code. You make a control flow graph out of that to represent the possible execution maps between them. Um, the concept of dominance, then, is to make sure that you know uh, if you reach block B um, for the first time, you know that you have had to execute block A before you got there. That's what dominance indicates, that A was dominant. So the nice thing about dominance is that, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, dominance relation then forms a tree of, of, of among the blocks. Okay, it imposes a tree and controls the graph. And the immediate dominator of a block is its immediate predecessor of that tree. Um, also, PCC has static single assignment form, which I'm very happy to be using after 18 years of not getting to. Um, <laughs> It really it makes an amazing difference. Um, so, so each name is a thing in static single assignment form is assigned to only once. So if, you, if your original program has a variable named X that's assigned to more than once, then we're going to rename it and give it a subscript. So we'll have X of 1, X of 2, and X of 3. So each definition happens once and its uses are replaced with those subscripted versions of X. <coughs> There's special handling for join points, which you can make that work. I'll talk more about that when we need to get to it. Um, so when you have static single assignment form, it really greatly uh, enhances your ability to, uh, to calculate available expressions over nonlinear paths, because you don't have to worry about kill sets. Nothing is ever killed in static single assignment form, because you just rename the variable and make sure that you didn't have to kill them. OK. So I mentioned that the Canada table is the, um, is the uh, central data structure for the past. And what we're really doing here is we're inventing yet another kind of value. There's a little bit more complex kind of value in here that's looking for specific kinds of candidates. Um, the first two kinds of candidates, I'm calling the can mult and the can add. Both of them contain both a multiply and an add, so that's confusing. Um, the reason that I chose that is so that it is the, uh, the operation that's performed last is how you can remember it. So B plus I the quantity times S, that's a can of mult. If you have a B plus the quantity I times S, that's a can of N. Okay. There's another thing called can of ref that we'll talk about much later. And then there's a can of fee, which is used for handling these conditional channels. So for the most part, we're going to talk about the first two. In all of them, we're going to use the same lingo of the base, the index, and the stride that I introduced earlier. And in the candidate table, we also contain a type field that helps us track the fact when we've had this cast happen in the middle and it's messed things up. Um, 
The concept of a basis is important when I talk about the instructions S0 and S1. We're taking S1 and, and rewriting it as add the result of S0. We're calling S0 uh, the basis for S1. It's the thing that we are strength reducing relative to. Uh, and then the term dependent is just the reverse of that relationship. If S0 is the basis of S1, S1 is a dependent of S0. And then the siblings are candidates that have the same basis. So what you, what you end up with then is you have this nice tree of all the related candidates that are using the same base and the same stride and just differ in their names. Okay, so for the cases of explicit multiplies, we're going to, we're going to be looking for these kinds of bases. So how do we go and load them up? Um, once again, that's just showing at the top there are the, uh, this is, this is what we're looking for, S0 and S1. We're looking for a pattern of that, of that kind. So that we can replace S1 with, again, this I minus I prime times S. And we want to, of course, fold that expression as much as we can. If S is a constant, then this turns out to be a simple N. If the stride is not constant, then we have to introduce a small So we'll talk about that. Um, and then again, N is just the opposite. Uh, or it, it, it looks very much the same. And uh, except that the parentheses are in a different place. And it turns out that we look at that candidate that the same exact replacement is what we're looking for. Once again, if you do the algebra, looking to replace it by y plus i minus i prime times x. So, regardless of which kind of candidate we have, we can do the same maneuver. It's just that the candidate and the basis both have to be in the same kind. They both have to be moments so we don't have to be asked. And the term I'm going to use for this i minus i prime I can talk about is we'll just call that the increment with respect to the basis. Um, so, how do we go about constructing the candidate table? Well, as I said, we're going to do a single forward walk over all the statements in, in the uh, info representation. And we're going to do it in denominator order. So, if we reach an instruction, we've already seen all the statements that dominate. As we're going along, we're going to uh, look at any statement that can contribute to one of these can bulbs or can add. So anything that can have a multiplier or add effect, um, that will include adds, pointer adds, subtracts, multiplies, negates, and uh, copies and type conversions. They're all different things. Now, since we don't know necessarily when we see a multiplication, whether it's going to be part of a can add or a can bulb, for example, we may have to have multiple interpretations for each of the statements that could come out. So I'll have separate entries in the candidate table more than one entry on occasion for the same statement and chain them together so we can uh, keep track of them. So as an example, if you have an add of two SSA names, either one of those could serve as the base uh, for one of those things. So we have to have two different um, interpretations and so forth. Uh, the last bullet there is, is kind of important. One of the things that we do while we're going forward is identifying potential dead code savings. Uh, when you run into an instruction, you would say, well, what if I was able to get rid of this at some point? And so you, you're, you're accruing how many previous instructions fed into it that would go dead as well if you managed to get rid of that. So the whole, the whole cost model is invoked at that point to keep track of what your possible savings are. This allows us to do everything in one pass without going back to gather more information. Um, so as we, as we encounter things, then, we're going to value a number of them in a special way, uh, looking for these kinds of candidates. So that we can use algebraic rules and propagate information forward and make, it, make inferences. So one of the most simple things we could do is we've seen something that says x equals y times c, and we go back and look at the candidate table and say, well, what does y represent? And it represents something of the form b plus i prime times s, and s is a constant. Well, if we multiply that by c, then we also get a nice representation that fits what we're looking for, because it would be the form b plus i prime times the folded value of c times s. So lots of little algebraic rules in order to do that as we move forward. One of the more interesting ones is an undistribution example. Again, if you see x is equal to y times c, and you see something of the same form, but this time the constant is, is a, 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 a multiple of, of, the, of the stride. I'm sorry, the stride is a multiple of this, of 
this constant that you just ran into. Then you can do the algebra and turn it into something else where you can fold the, uh, the uh, k value there inside the expression. So this is actually important because what happens is that uh, uh, as we're going through the various optimizations, uh, distributed rules will be applied and we will have complicated things to the point where we wouldn't recognize some opportunities otherwise unless we have to get this distributive uh, uh, value stuff. So once we've discovered that we've got something of the right form, we want to know, well, does it have a basis that we've already seen before? In order to find them, then we have to be able to maintain our mapping to everything that's about the same basis. And so if we do that, then we can find everything that's also about the same stride. So a basis has to solve these properties, it has to satisfy these properties that we've been talking about. It has to have the exact same base, it has to have the exact same stride. It can have a different index. And usually will. And they have to be of the same kind. They have to be can moles or can dabs. You can't mix the two. And the types have to be compatible. So I say see slide three, that's that thing where we have that unsigned bottom popping up in the middle. If you have one candidate where we change the type halfway through and another candidate where we didn't, then we can't uh, treat these things as equivalent because they really are going to be something you can uh, just add four to and not necessarily change the semantics. For example, we might have with unsigned arithmetic in C, um, overflow is considered to wrap. Uh, but sign is undefined by, by, uh, by default. So you have to watch out for all these kinds of things that always cause us trouble. And of course, the basis has to dominate the camera. It has to be fully available. Now, the thing is, you can have a chain of these things. If you remember on that first slide, we kept adding one to I over and over. And that would form this nice chain of possible candidates. And any one of those candidates that had come before could serve as a basis. So we had to be arbitrarily to pick one. Uh, for now, what we've chosen to do is to just pick the most immediately dominating basis. There are reasons why we may not want to do that in the final version of this. I'll talk about that later. The reason for doing this in the first place is that up a level of limit of the introduction of lifetimes. You know, we'll just keep, we won't make sure we won't take the furthest away from this basis and keep this long, long lifetime of the registered allocator we'll have to deal with later. Unfortunately, when you go through other subsequent optimizations, it, it, it may just totally be defeated, uh, and usually it is. But, uh, now the thing is, we've, we've, we've figured out what we can change, but now we have to figure out whether we should. Um, so profitability is uh, what we need to look at next. And in most cases, uh, or in many cases, things are easy, and we can just say, well, it's always profitable. Which kind of cases are those? Um, if, you have this, if you have a stride value of test that's a constant, then it's always going to be profitable to replace it. Or, well, as I say there, it's going to be not profitable to replace it. It's, it's either a good idea or it's neutral. So, uh, something to point out here is these cases only involve the can multiplier because if you look at a can add, you'll see that you have um, this fold here. If the stride is a constant, then what you have is just an add. There's no multiplier in any that you need to construct the base. So we don't need to worry about that case. If you have a multiply, it's going to look something like this. You add B and I prime together, multiply that times S, add B and I together, multiply that times S. The result is you're going to change this last multiply to an add. And potentially you're going to get rid of some net code here. And if this value of n is not used anywhere else, then we can get rid of that. So if we are able to get rid of it, then it's good. We're down to three instructions. One of the multiplies that turn into an add. Uh, otherwise, we still turn the multiply into an add, so it's probably a good idea. Now suppose that the stride is not a constant. It's just we just see it as an SSA name, we don't know what's in it, but it's the same between us and our basis. Well, if the value failure of increment is minus 1 or 0 or 1, then it's still profitable because we don't need to introduce a multiplier. We're just introducing either an add or subtract or a so That's simple. So the case that gets interesting, finally, and maybe something here is interesting in this talk, I don't know, um, if, is when the increment uh, is greater than 1. And, or, I'm sorry, the absolute value of increment is greater than 1. So we're not talking about the easy cases. And the stride is not a known fixed constant. In this case, we're going to replace the candidate 
with um, this expression here, but in this case, we're introducing a multiply. Okay. So when we introduce the multiply, it may not exist anywhere yet. If it doesn't, then we actually have to create it. Could, there's a possibility that we've already seen it, and we can take advantage of the fact that that's been calculated before, but we have to assume that we can't for now. So if we don't have any savings from getting rid of dead code, then we could worsen performance by making this change. So in that case, we really need to know uh, what's the total cost of replacing everything that's involved with the same additional answer. So the idea is to look through all these uh, chains of candidates uh, that, that have the same initializer and see what the total cost is then for doing the replacement. So the cost it involves inserting the initializer, getting rid of dead code, and the savings that introduced by replacing the multiplier that have. So then we make an all or nothing decision for all of those related candidates that have the same income. If we do have an inserted initializer, then we just look for the uh, nearest common denominator position and that's the closest possible place to dominate everything that needs to be. So, what, kind, what do we mean by profitability now? Um, depends on what you're doing, right? Are you optimizing for size or are you optimizing for speed? If you're optimizing for size, everything is simple. You just want to say, well, what's the total number of instructions that we have left after we make this change? Uh, is it more or less than we have to start with? <clears throat> optimizing for speed is not so simple because you might improve things along one path, you might make things slightly worse along another path. So you need to have some sort of policy in that case. Uh, currently, what I have prototyped is we have to improve things along at least one path. Now, if you have profiling data available, you might be able to make better decisions than that. Or you might decide to be extremely conservative and say, well, I'm only going to make this change and it's going to make things better along all possible. The problem, though, is that we don't, in GCC, it's, uh, it's kind of odd because you say, well, am I optimizing for size or am I optimizing for speed? It can actually be a per block decision. Uh, it can be different in different places. So you have to make some sort of a judgment call when you're talking about five different candidates in different parts of the program. One of them says this is a size block, one of them says this is a speed block, and you have to come up with some sort of and for now, it's just the root of the tree is what I'm using to determine uh, which, is, which is the best. So there are limitations on this model of, of the increment. Uh, what I've talked about so far is the way that I've got this prototype. There is uh, more involved analysis that could be done and would, probably should be done uh, to make things better. The way we come up with this increment depends on which one of the possible bases that we chose. So if you take, if you just go to i equals i plus 1, then this particular, you know, the increment is always going to be 1 going back to the one previously. And you could be, you know, go back 2 and take the value of 2, and that might have some, some better choice. So, you know, you might want to search through all the potential spaces of increment choices for the different candidates in order to determine what the best possible cost is. One interesting case that uh, Richard Earnshaw pointed out um, is that if you have a target that's got a shift and add instruction, which not everybody does, then it's really good to have your initializer be a power of two so that you can get rid of the multiply and get rid of the shift and add instructions. So you might want to be searching through and looking for possible bases and bias things towards power of two. Um, register pressure is a problem throughout the uh, middle end phases. Um, 
we have tons and tons of optimizations that try to return lifetime as much as possible and leave the, uh, the register elevator hanging uh, to, to deal with all the issues. Um, we could, yeah, it's really about all we can do is to limit things. You, know, you, you, can, you can take a choice and say, I don't want to look too far back for my basis. I might want to expire and this is out of my cash at some point and say, you know, I need some sort of a distance metric in order to do that and say, well, how far is too far uh, for this? And you can calculate that in a variety of ways since you're walking through the down later where you could keep track of some of that. So yeah. Another issue would be your creating new dependencies and you're preventing the instruction because you're doing it totally. Yes, that is another problem. Um, that you're creating more dependencies and, and have less parallelization opportunities. And that's another thing that you could look at as part of checking out which bases are better. Many times it might be better to look back for a further basis than which would provide more parallelism. Um, so that's another opportunity. Yes? What about um, like on x86, where you have a lot of computational power in the addressing modes that doesn't take extra registers? And so, in many cases, you wouldn't want to do this stuff. You want to leave it in, in the address modes to avoid the register pressure. Yeah, um, for the most part, from what I from what I understand, I think that what we're doing is going to be leaving things still in um, in a harmless state with regard to with regard to that. Um, no, not in all cases. And actually, we are proposing Yeah. Do you have any data on the effectiveness of this optimization? 
I don't really have a whole lot. Um, earlier, um, this is the kind of thing where you're not going to see a whole lot for the most part. You're not going to see a whole lot of performance differences over it. Um, because it happens in straight line areas, we're not looking at the loop portions. Unless you happen to have an, op an option like this, probably like this that occurs inside the loop um, for a non induction variable, then you're not going to see anything like this box show up in the total. Um, that's a good point. Let's see. Fees, yeah, the fees are probably the most interesting thing. Let's, let's, let's talk briefly about how to deal with that in the same model. So, with fees, you have to deal with, with, with a static single assignment form, you have to deal with this concept of a joint point. We've said that every definition only defines one single, uh, it is only uh, used once, every variable is defined only once. So, what happens when we reach a use that's uh, down here like x3, which is reached by both x1 and x2? And we have to create this artificial thing called a fee that just represents a joint point. It says that x3 will have a value that is either x1 or it's x2. We don't know which. So, uh, so when we see one of those, it gets in the way. But this, this is what we need to be looking at for dealing with the conditional candidate case. So this is, this is a busy slide. I want you to ignore the stuff in the middle that's in parentheses there for now. Just look at the, the left and right pieces. So if we have a conditional candidate over on the left, we want to be able to do the same thing with A5 down here that we've been doing with all the others. We'd like to replace this with, with an add. Um, however, what's happened is that X has been incremented along one path but not along the other, and that's been incremented again. So we want to replace it by 10, uh, by an add with 10 if we went through this path, or an add with 5 if we went down this path. So the way that we want the code to look when we're done is to um, introduce this add by 5 along this path. And then we introduce a new fee to take into account that we don't know whether the value of A4 or the value of T6 here is what we care about, and then add 5 to that again down here. That's the result that we're looking for. Um, however, uh, what we have here in the middle is an identification of what it looks like in Canada table. This, this one is a can wall, this one is a can add, and so forth. If you look at A5, it can't use A4 for a basis by the definition of the table, because the two of them have to have the exact same base value. And here they don't, they have values of x2 and x0. So in order to do that, we have to figure out what to do with this feed that's in the middle, that's in the way. And so, um, in, in this case, what we have is we're going to call A4 here to be a hidden basis. In order to find that, we, what we recognize then is that X3 here was defined by a fee statement. To, to be able to use this properly, then we have to analyze this X0 and X1, these arguments, to the fee and determine whether they both have the same uh, derived base name. They both go back to the same B dimension. So uh, what that corresponds to is if you have one argument like x1 here, you go back and look and see whether that's a simple add. If it is a simple add, then its basis, its derived basis, is the uh, x0 basis. If it's not a simple add, then you've got x0 itself is what you need. So in both cases, those match, and x0 is the value that we want to store with its feed in order to be able to recognize this pattern. So that's really all we're doing here is recognize the same pattern. Uh, this, this particular pattern is in this uh, hand the table to store the fees in that fashion. Um, since there's only a few minutes left, let me just point out that the profitability for these conditional candidates is, is more complicated still than it was before. Well, the, uh, <laughs> First of all, for those cases where the stride is a known constant, uh, you have to introduce some compensation code up there, in those, like we had to add that, that extra add in the conditional model. Introducing that compensation code may make it more expensive uh, for the cost model. So, uh, in some cases, that, that may be too expensive to, to do a replacement. Also, when we have uh, unknown strides, 
So, so when, when we're looking at conditional candidates, we, we have this problem that we, uh, that we are changing the basis when we get to the feed. It no longer has the same base name. And so you, can, you consider your conditional candidates with everything that came before, but that breaks the basis chain. You have to start with at that point. So another way of looking at that is that the feed will always be showing up at the frontiers of the tree. So I'm going to uh, just skip over the, uh, the addressing expression part and the slides are out there uh, on Diego. We'll put them down on the wiki. So have a look at those at your leisure. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the status of the project and future work. Uh, stage one of this is complete for the time being. We've, we've put in the explicit multiplies with the known strides, as long as they're fairly easy to determine the profit uh, module of what we're discussing today. Um, handling of the reference candidates that I didn't talk about has uh, been submitted for approval. Uh, and the rest is still in this new program stage. There's plenty of time for the United to affect uh, the outcome of particularly these cost discussions we've been having. So I'm interested in the general uh, comments about that. Some of the additional remaining issues uh, I talked about the need, the need to improve the increment selection for the explicit multiplies, look for a wider possible search, and uh, do better choices for the targets to shift at. So we can also incur uh, perhaps the most dangerous. 